this is the undergraduate panel and here we have about six speakers we're still waiting on a couple of them but the majority of them are already here so we have sasha who's an undergraduate student in her third year at harvard and she's studying neurobiology and literature and we have davina who's a senior at mcmaster university also majoring in neuroscience Next, we have Yug, and he's a fourth year um, biological science major at Rowan's University's Honors College. And we have Kaushik, who is a second year biology major at Ashoka University. Next, we have Amari, who's a rising junior at Stanford University, and they're majoring in bioengineering. Next, we have Inchira, who is an undergraduate student at the University of Warwick. So just a friendly reminder, during the lecture, everyone should be muted so as to not disturb um, the speakers. But at the end, we'll have a quick Q&A and um, we'll be open for questions and you can unmute to ask them. Now, during the lecture, I will say that you can uh, send chats and questions in the meeting chat room. Just be sure not to spam or uh, write inappropriate messages. So without further ado, we will get started if we if the speakers would like to start. Yeah, of course. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining again. I'm Sasha. I think we can do like some quick introductions from each of us too. Um, I'm Sasha. I'm currently the COO of Simply Neuroscience, and I've been with SN for around four or five years now, which is crazy to th think about. Um, also, rising junior at Harvard University, studying neurobiology um, on the pre-med track, and then comparative literature as a minor. So I think how we're styling this panel is just an open Q&A. So if anybody has any questions about college life, you know, undergrad studies, neuroscience as like a college student, research, anything in that realm, um, we're more than happy to answer, but I'll hand it off to you if you want to introduce yourself too. Perfect, thanks so much, Sasha. So hi everyone, uh, it's great to have you all here. Uh, my name is Yug. I'm the co-director here of Outreach and Research at Simply Neuroscience. I've been here for probably now three years, which is, as Sasha mentioned, as it time flies here. Uh, I'm an undergrad at Rowan University going into my final year, uh, majoring in biology with getting a minor in public policy. Uh, hopefully in the near future, going to go into pediatric neurology, pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, but yeah, uh, again, as Sasha mentioned, any questions, please, please feel free to put in the chat and I'll have it, I'll hand it over to Davinia. Hi everyone, my name is Davina. I've also been at SN for about three years now. So I started working here in 2020. It's been a lovely experience. So I'm going into my senior year of university at McMaster. It's in Canada and I'm majoring in neuroscience and I'm hoping to go to grad school for neuroscience research. So if you have any questions about like getting involved with neuroscience in high school or brain B, or um, just anything about neuroscience in general or extracurriculars or the university experience, you're more than welcome to, to ask me any of those questions. And I will pass it off to Amari. Hi everyone, I'm Amari. I'm a third year at Stanford University. This is my first couple of months with SN and I'm a volunteer with the Synapse podcast. Um, I'm majoring in bioengineering with a minor in biology and another minor in Spanish. So if you have any questions when it comes to going to a university that may not have a specific neuroscience major and how to still incorporate that into your plan, please feel free to ask. And yeah, I'm happy to have everybody here today. Is there anyone else left that I forgot to call? I, no, don't. I, think that's, I think that's all, yeah. Okay. If we, if we see Koshik and Indra, we will we'll spot them in the crowd. Um, as, a, as a first question, so all of y'all are pursuing some sort of STEM degree in some shape or form or connected to STEM. How did you find this particular major or this particular program and especially combining it with adjacent interests like comparative literature and public policy? How does that intersection working for you? I 
I can go ahead and answer first. Um, so for a while, I knew that I wanted to study neuroscience in my undergraduate studies. Neuroscience is always something I was interested in. I kind of learned about the brain for the first time, like in science class in middle school and was like, this is something that has, like there's so many questions that I wanna answer. Um, so going into college, that was definitely something that I wanted to focus on. But in terms of like, incorporating other non-STEM studies within neuroscience or like with neuroscience, that was definitely a little bit harder to decide going into school, especially as a pre-med when it's not discouraged, but it's kind of, it's like less common to find pre-meds who might be majoring in a non-STEM or in the humanities. Um, so Harvard is super flexible with their different academic programs. So instead of like minors, they have something called secondaries, which basically function as the same thing. So for me, that was the best path where I would have a comparative literature minor slash secondary. And that allows me to take classes that I'm still interested in, you know, keeping those humanities, those English classes that I love, but still having this like primary focus with neuroscience. And then at Harvard, you also have like doubles. So you can have two separate degrees that are like of equal weight. So I could do neuro and complet as like two separate big things. There's also joints that Harvard offers, which is a little bit unique, where you have two fields of study, but you have to write a thesis at the end of four years, which combine the two fields. So if I did neurocomplet, I would have to find a research lab that could combine both interests. Um, so things like that, it's really dependent on, I think, like the school that you go to and how they help students with like the different academic paths that you can go down. Um, but I think Harvard is really great in that it's super flexible with like how much you want to prioritize each and that you totally can do at the humanities, even if you're pre-med. Um, or if you want to focus on a STEM field like neuroscience. So taking it from there, I think uh, for me and most people, the staff know it's simply neuroscience. I, I have been always interested in pediatrics since I was like a kid that I knew that was going to be my dream job. Uh, my real feel, uh, love when uh, neurology came in was actually I had an internship in high school at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, there I shadowed Dr. Banwell, who I, is, I still consider one of the best mentors I've ever had. And she really, she, she was a pediatric neurologist focusing on neuroimmunology and pediatric multiple sclerosis. And she really got me interested in how very little we don't know in neurology, even though we, we know a lot, but not a lot at the same time. And so she got me interested in how, you know, clinical trials are running for neurology, um, how to combine pediatrics and neurology together and that's been my that's been the field I've been now going pursuing uh, for uh, the interest part so I so at Rowan we neuroscience is still developing right now uh, we just last year got a minor for it uh, they're still working for a major for it so the closest thing for me uh, was to go to biology so joining organizations like simply neuroscience um, doing my own self-education on the brain and uh, pursuing research in neuroscience at my school is really how I tried to focus in neurology. Uh, my focus in public policy, as Chinmay mentioned, uh, really came about uh, also through my mom. She, uh, before, before switching careers, she really wanted to go into public policy. And so that Gen X client came into me. Uh, but uh, yeah, I really didn't know how much there was a lack of STEM until someone really told me an interesting fact where it's like over half the bills the United States Congress passes are related to STEM in some sort of way. So that's a, so just seeing how much public policy impacts STEM really got me motivated. And, you know, going through competitions, writing my own papers out of just self-interest, I slowly developed that habit and um, now I'm just now seeing how uh, we could move forward with public policies, such as making, you know, legislation on getting people with multiple sclerosis tested more or people with um, ALS and new treatment by the government. Yeah, um, so to answer the original question, so I'm just a neuroscience major, major. I'm unfortunately not minoring in anything, but something that I'm really interested in is how students learn best. I'm really interested in the education experience for students and 
what aspects of taking a course in university or taking a class in high school or doing a club, like what parts of those make students learn best? Is it when there are a lot of interactives or ways that they can apply their learning? Or is it more just like throwing a bunch of content at them? And I think at this point in my learning career, it's, I think I've noticed that it's just a combination of both and also realizing that students learn best in different ways and trying to incorporate that into the overall education experience because, um, I'm just really interested in neuroscience and I think sometimes students don't really know about it. Like I helped organize the Hamilton local brain bee this year and there were only a couple of schools that showed up and it's because not a lot of schools know that brain bee even exists or that there's an area for students to compete in neuroscience academia in high school. And it's just, it's not very well, like it's not very well understood. And sometimes it's just hard for people to get access to it too, or to even realize that it exists because it's more of a niche interest or it's seen as more of a niche interest. So something that I'm passionate about is spreading awareness that neuroscience exists and that if you're interested in the brain or how we think or how we perceive things, it doesn't even just have to be core neuroscience. It can be things like behavior or cognition or just how we perceive the world, but there are ways for you to do that. So I'm kind of balancing that major interest in neuroscience and then a supporting interest in how people learn and what we can do about that. So I'm doing a senior thesis too. It's on behavior and cognition. So I'm going to be working with adults who stutter and we're kind of looking at how feedback loops in the brain impact how people that stutter actually end up stuttering and how it could be potentially like a positive feedback loop. And so um, I'm really excited to do that work this year. So far, my prep has been a lot of um, primary research and then familiarizing myself with the code. Sometimes neuroscience is um, kind of code heavy, depending on what fields of neuroscience you go into. Sometimes people work with code. Sometimes people work more in a clinical setting. So they work with mice or rodents or even sometimes fish if they're like wanting to study simple, simple nervous systems. But yeah, there are a ton of different ways to go into it. And I'm just hoping to help people get accustomed to which, which different ways you can get involved with. Yeah, I'd say for me, <clears throat> coming to Stanford was an interesting experience because I first came in not really even understanding what neuroscience was or not really knowing that was an option for me. I think growing up like in certain communities, you don't really even think of that as an option. And until I started going to Stanford and taking classes and looking up researchers that work with brain organoids. That's when I truly started becoming interested in the process of figuring out how to create a path for me at Stanford where neuroscience can exist, even though there isn't a major. I know that some people mentioned like there isn't a major or there isn't a minor, but there are still ways to involve yourself in those things, whether that's clubs, whether that's taking specific courses, whether that's you know, saying I'm going to do a biology major, but do a concentration in neurobiology or at Stanford, we have symbolic systems and there's a neuroscience concentration. There's also individual majors where you can create your own engineering major and do neuroengineering. And that's something that I'm interested in. So finding ways to incorporate neuroscience into your education, if that's something that's really important to you, is super easy as long as you're very proactive about it. So I'll keep it short and sweet and we can move on to the next question. Got a variety of questions coming in. So I guess we can uh, go in order. Uh, first one is, what are some programs and extracurriculars in high school that showed your interest in neuroscience and made your resumes look good for college? Maybe we can go reverse order this time. <laughs> or you could start off. Yeah, I'll start. So um, I didn't really have an interest in neuroscience in high school, but one thing that I can say that's very easy to show your interest is volunteer work. So either that's volunteering in a hospital for a neurology clinic or something like that, that's a really good way to show your interest. Currently right now I'm doing medical assistant training, which some of you might be a little too young for, but if you're training to do like a medical assistant or be a scribe, scribe work is also something that a lot of people do and you can work for a neurologist or even shadow a neurosurgeon. There's also in New York through Lenox Hill, they do brain turns, which is a summer program that they do where you can shadow neurosurgeons and neurologists and different people in neuroscience over Zoom. So there are ways you just gotta 
look for and look for mentors. Like, don't be afraid if you see a neurosurgeon on Instagram that you think is really cool. Don't be afraid to DM them and be like, hey, I think you're really cool. Can I shadow you? Or so just put yourself out there and shadow volunteer work. And if you can get into research as early as high school, I'd recommend that as well. Yeah, so I would also recommend volunteering as well. So I was a, my high school offered like a joint volunteer program in the summer with a local hospital. And when you volunteered in the hospital, hospital they kind of gave you preference or they gave, they let you pick your preference of where you wanted to work. And there was a neurodiagnostics department. So I got to volunteer there and they also let me sit in on a UEG, which was really cool. So um, if you find the process of like trying to find areas in neuroscience volunteering to be a little bit overwhelming, you could start with something as general as a hospital and just see what different facilities there are. If you have sleep study uh, clinics because hospitals sometimes have those. You can kind of just work your way in from there. And then another meaningful extracurricular that I did in high school was I did brain B in my junior and senior year of high school. And I definitely found that to be super worthwhile. Um, in my senior year when I did brain B, I um, ended up placing um, in the state, which was a really fun experience because my family was there too. But it's just a way for you to kind of study some material in neuroscience and also apply it too. So the way that brain B works in my state or Massachusetts is you um, you write a written test. It's about 20 or 25 questions long. And then you go up to a little brain model and then they have it labeled with a bunch of numbers. And then you, you know, write, okay, number one is the frontal lobe or number two is something else. And then after you do that, you go up to about five um, med students or research students that are posing as patients. And then they're gonna read you a list of symptoms. And then you have to go, okay, this is what I diagnosed them with. And then, after that's done, you hand in your tests and then they grade it. And while they're grading it, you get to listen to lectures by uh, people that are involved in neuroscience in that med school or in that university, which is also another great way to network. And I believe every state hosts a brain bee. So if that's something you're interested in, it is hopefully available to you. But after that, then they grade the tests and the way that it worked in my state was the top 10 students get to go sit up at the front and do a round robin oral brain bee. And then that's how it goes from there. But I found both of those experiences to be extremely worthwhile. So my discovery of neurology came on accident. So um, I went to an environmental science high school. So all we did was turtles, fish, fish, and more turtles. So I, I, it's a, my fascination of medicine and more general neurology came about uh, as both uh, Amari and Dania have mentioned, uh, I also volunteered at a hospital, uh, uh, worked at the main information desk. So I had a unique advantage in that sense that I was able to go explore all the different facilities at the hospital. So I could see and like how doctors talk, nurses talk about their specialties. Uh, junior year came around, uh, people in my family were asking, are you doing an internship? I didn't realize I had to do an internship or I should be doing one. So I Googled a bunch of places, found deadlines had passed, applied to two places at 11.59 PM. And luckily behold, I uh, got into CHOP. Uh, it's been, um, so that was my main extracurricular that I did there that really helped me get into what neurology is. I also did a lot of independent research. So you can start off with as really basic, like my project was gathering 60 people. Uh, some of them I did not know at all and tracking their blood pressure and seeing, hey, does taking 10,000 steps a day like actually work in the short term? So you can start out very simple in research projects and just go from there, get just build it, build it, build it. And you can land a really great project from there. So if you're ever interested in neuroscience and you don't have that kind of background or don't have a school like that, always try to do your own independent stuff, whether it be researching extracurricular activities, competitions, um, doing your own research projects. And most importantly, I would say if you want, email professors, especially in neurology. Um, you never know who you can get and you never know who can answer back and help you. It's always, it's always uh, try and repeat type of scenarios. 
Yeah, no, I think everything that I wanted to say has already been said. Um, I think it can be pretty intimidating, you know, getting into neuroscience as a high school student because it's one of those like, inaccessible subjects, especially in like high school curriculum. Um, and for me, I did the exact same thing. I did hospital volunteering and then I volunteered at a neurosurgery clinic like through that hospital. Um, so that was like my first taste of like neuroscience in the real world. Um, but I really want to echo what you were saying about um, independent research because I think that's a super easy way to learn more about the field without depending on others especially if you are in like you know an area where like a hospital might not be nearby or it's like difficult to find like a research lab you can easily just like find you know papers online or there's really interesting books if you need book recommendations like you can email info at sn you can ask for book recommendations we have book recommendation lists on our website um of like you know memoirs from neurosurgeons or just like reading a lot and that's something you can do on your own just to get learn more about the field um, and then a big part of my application was also just simply neuroscience because I started my sophomore year of high school. Um, and then just having people around you that are your age that are also interested in neuroscience is also like a game changing experience, like having peers that I could talk to about their brain journeys, what they're doing. Um, you know, there's like book clubs within SN that we had, we had meetings, like just being in a community of people that are also interested in what you're interested in is also super helpful. So not to plug SN or anything, but if you're interested in joining a community like that and you're a high school student looking for that, um, SN is a great place to be too. So yeah. Great responses and great journeys all around. Um, kind of, I think this one, Davina would be a perfect fit to talk about with Brain B, uh, but also, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, um, but in general, do you feel like it is very important to compete in competitions related to neuroscience, Brain B Science Fair? Uh, and be involved in, in research and whatnot that is specifically neuroscience related in high school. Is that a really key factor for getting into top colleges? Yeah, so I actually think it's honestly not the most important thing when you're applying to top colleges. Honestly, I would, I think, I'm not an admissions officer, so I can't really say for sure, but I feel like your interest in what you're passionate about will come through in your application, regardless of whether or not whether or not you've competed in any competitions or done research. It could be that the competitions you've done or the research you've completed have helped fuel your passions, and we can talk about that when you're applying to universities. So that can obviously help, but it's definitely not required to get into those universities. There are tons of different things that they look at besides your extracurriculars that are also very important. So while you can definitely do it and write about it and explain how it's impactful to you, there are definitely other things that you can do. And I don't believe the way that they accept students into particular majors is based on how much neuroscience experience you have. Tons of people major in neuroscience without having any experience with neuroscience competitions or research or even classes in high school because it's kind of hard to do. So don't worry about it if you don't have any competitions or, or research while you're in high school, it's okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, this one is a little bit looking past college, but it's something to think about when you're in college and in high school. What are the job prospects for someone with only a, a bachelor's in neuroscience or related degree, so going straight into the workforce? All of y'all are like, we're not thinking about jobs right now. <laughs> yeah. oh, I, I guess. Um, that's a very good qu question. Um, I guess wherever you are in the world is going to be very different. You know, a BSc in the UK is very different from a BS in the United States. So I guess, listen, I'm making random assumptions here. I'm very sorry to not answer your question to whoever asks this, but with a bachelor's in neuroscience or a bachelor's in biology, you there is a wide variety of things you can do. If you're interested in public policy, you can probably join a PhD student or a local university's uh, institute, and maybe you can work there. If you're interested in writing articles, you could go for maybe a jo uh, assistant job at, uh, say, Scientific American and write articles there. Um, you could also join a lab as a research assistant. Um, I know, oh, this is actually a very good question. Okay, so Definitely the one thing I do know is that if you do have a bachelor's in neuroscience and you're really interested in the clinical side, either in pharmacology, um, you know, the doctoral side of like that, 
you could join a hospital and join as a research assistant and working under doctors or PhD um, laboratories, and you could help out with either wet lab, um, helping run clinical trials, participating. So those types of job prospects, at least in the United States, a bachelor's in neuroscience could definitely help you there. Yeah, so for the neuroscience like prospects after you graduate, I will say this is a tougher one because most of my friends in my program, so the neuroscience cohort at my university, there's only 19 of us. So we're really, really small. But I think most of the people that I know are either considering grad school or med school or doing their master's in like a related but slightly different field of work than neuroscience. So I think I think that's that also makes the question a little bit more tough to answer. But the courses that we've taken throughout our program, our program is very research-based. So it sets you up to essentially be a researcher in the neuroscience field. So they set you up for grad school if you want to work with like clinical research in hospitals, if you want to potentially do social work or go into psychology, you can also do that as well. They kind of set you up for those situations or those prospects as well. But um, most of the people that I have seen so far, and of course this isn't everybody, are most of them are considering doing schooling after the four years of undergrad. And something important to note too is that often pay scales differ with how much experience you have beyond your degree. So just having a neuroscience degree without any real hands-on experience to back it up is not super advantageous. So outside of the classroom stuff, just as important as that diploma. Uh, another, another question, which is about school choices, because it's, uh, it's a tough one. So we're obviously manifesting that everyone on here is getting into multiple colleges, right? And then you're gonna be in the wonderful position of deciding where in the world are you gonna go for the next four or five years? So what exactly went into choosing and making that decision? Was it the type of majors available? Was it location, opportunities, tuition, of course? What was going through your head a few years ago? Um, I guess I'll go. So um, this is going to be a brutally honest answer for me and for everyone here. But uh, with my university, it came very last minute. Unfortunately, the universities I wanted to get into, unfortunately, that did not happen. So I just chose my university because they did give me a chunk of good scholarship money. And I just chose to go there. Um, was it the smartest decision in the world? Possibly not. Uh, but I, but you know, you know, things make uh, things happen and things make work out. So even though I maybe I've never touched foot on that campus, I just accepted the offer and said, God hope it'll work out. And you know what? It has. So honestly, I would definitely say, you know, if you are in a situation that, you know, you are look that you know, you have multiple colleges, I would definitely say look at the finance, in my perspective, look at the finances first, because although a college could be really great and really renowned, if you're paying $75,000 a year, you may have to consider, you know, is it really worth it? Or are you, or you have the finances to take out that much debt to pursue, let's say, a bachelor's in neuroscience compared to going to a public university where you may have to pursue some like biology, but you have the finances that you can afford to pursue your degree. Yeah, I'd say for me personally, finance was the biggest thing and I was lucky enough to get into a school that has great financial aid. So there's that. But on top of that, I also wanted to make sure that the school that I went to had the resources that would prepare me to enter into whatever field was necessary for me or whatever I decided I loved when I got to college. Um, when I first got to Stanford and I realized, I would say soon after I got in, oh wait, I wanna study neuroscience, but they don't have a neuroscience major. I was like, oh, what do I do now? But after 
looking into the different majors and seeing, okay, well, even though they don't have neuroscience, they have all these research labs, they have these clubs. And even if they don't have these clubs, what clubs can I create? Are they receptive to students taking on responsibility and taking on the initiative of starting? So I'd say when looking for a university, especially when it comes to top colleges, because a lot of them are well-resourced and that's just a fact. So it's a matter of seeing fit, like how do you fit into the community? Location, location does matter. Being in San Francisco, being near Silicon Valley is a great opportunity for a lot of people. So looking at location, looking at opportunities, looking at fit, but I'd most importantly look at where makes you happiest. I, I know that may sound very cheesy, but being happy in college is very important because of the stress that you're going to take on from all the work that you're doing. So just making sure that they have the mental health resources and that they have all the things necessary for you to succeed while being there. So yeah, that, that was a long-winded answer, but just make sure you're happy wherever you go. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with that. I think for me, um, going into college applications, I was researching a lot of different schools. And then after you read so many websites, like all the mission statements start to sound the same, all the schools start to sound the same. It's like, there's hundreds of schools out there. How do you know what's your fit? Um, so I think like just from the get go, when you're applying or like figuring out what schools to apply to, I think it's really good to like sit down with yourself and like reflect like, what are your like top three like must haves? Like for me, it was like, I need to be in a big city. I grew up in like small suburban town, not, it's not a town, but like there's not much to do. So I was like, I wanna be in a big city. Second thing is like, I want the school to be a good pre-med school. I wanna have like research opportunities. You know, I want the classes to align um, with like neuroscience, like things that I'm interested in. Um, and the last big thing for me was like, I want a school that really um, kind of embraces exploration and like the liberal arts. Like I want something where I can like explore outside of just neuroscience. Um, so those are my big three things. If like a school didn't have one of those three, like I crossed it out. And so that helped me narrow it down um, quite a lot. And then once I got into the schools, a lot of it at the very end did come down to financial aid. So what school did was mo most practical for me and my family. Um, but I think something that really helped because I applied during my COVID. So I wasn't able to visit um, campuses, which is like a super big disadvantage when you're trying to decide like, you know, like where you're going to fit. Um, but something that I that really helped me when like figuring out where I want to go was reaching out to students I knew that went to that school or like even if you don't know anybody you can like go on Instagram and like like, like universities in their bios and so just be like hey like I just got in I wanted to ask some questions about you know your school and like listen to students who go there like now because they can give you insights that are not on the website so like little inside scoops, which are really helpful for deciding whether or not that's really your fit. You can even reach out to professors. Like sometimes they're responsive on their emails when they hear like, oh, you're a high school student who has just admitted and they're excited to talk to you. Um, so that's definitely a good resource, was a good resource for me and may help you with selecting your school in the end. Yeah, I think everything I wanted to say has honestly already been mentioned, but I will say um, one last thing. I, if a school didn't offer neuroscience as a major, I immediately crossed it off my list. That, honestly, that was one of my two, like, like, I guess, deal breakers. So if they didn't offer a neuroscience program, I was like, no, thank you. But um, second, I think was also like trying to finance because I knew I definitely either wanted to go to grad school or med school. And med school do be very expensive I was looking even at like in my in-state tuition and in-state tuition is still a lot even in comparison to like what university is so I tried to make sure I pick something that was financially responsible great points everyone thank you um a quick kind of on the note of if you end up having to go to a university where there is no neuroscience program there uh, and especially because a lot of schools still have programs that are somewhat related, but not super neurospecific. Um, suggestions on what to do in those situations. Uh, some colleges have the option to pitch your own major, right, and create a program for yourself. But what can you kind of do outside of the classroom in that case to pursue that interest still? I 
I can go first, but one second. I'm okay. Trying to charge my laptop, but anyway. Um. Well, when I first came to Stanford, like I said, there was no neuroscience major, so my first recommendation is start your four-year plan early. I know that might seem like daunting to have to sit down and like plan out this quarter or semester, whatever your school goes by. I'm going to have to take this class then and this class then. And it might seem, you know, scary to think about all of that before even being a freshman, but it made my life so much easier when it came to figuring out how to incorporate neuroscience into it because especially being pre-med, you're going to take a lot of biology classes if you are pre-med. So what I decided to do is say, okay, well, I'm going to do bioengineering because I really like the research aspect of it and neuroengineering. But at the same time, since I'm taking so many biology classes, I'm just going to pick up a biology minor, which also allows me to specify I'm only going to take these neuroscience classes instead of having to take, let's say, ecology or like the study of like turtles and birds or, or whatever else that there is that isn't like neuroscience related you can do that. But also look into other majors that may not be specifically neuroscience, but offers like a sub plan. So like most universities, biology has a sub plan of neurobiology. Um, I know that other universities, like I think MIT calls it brain and cognitive sciences. Like there are so many different names for neuroscience that you might not realize that that's what it is or there are ways to like individually plan your major or your thesis or your final research project, just focus it on that. So I know that there were lots of courses that I took at Stanford where it was, um, let's say introduction to the fundamentals of bioengineering. And within most classes, you're gonna do projects. So you can do an individualized project where you can say, okay, well, I'm gonna focus on the neuroengineering of one brain organoid and change certain genes to figure out if it's more susceptible to this disease or that disease. So just find ways to incorporate it into your everyday that you can do that. And once you do that, I think it will make your life so much easier versus worrying about, you know, will med schools care that I don't have a necessary like neuroscience major? Will they like be accepting of me saying I want to be a neurologist but I don't even have a neuroscience degree they will as long as you show interest so yeah just incorporate it into your courses and if you have any questions about that like planning and like figuring out neuroscience and you're not in that uh and you're in a position like mine please feel free to reach out I definitely echo whatever has been just said um from definitely um when if you are in that position that you your school does not offer a major in neuroscience nor a minor in it um definitely um there is a lot of universities with that situation but they have professors that do research within it so for example they might look at you know they might uh study cells but it's related to Alzheimer's disease they may study um CRISPR technologies but it's going to help revolutionize you know neuroscience in like 10 years so definitely look for professors in whatever college you're going to and see what type of research they do if there are and make a list of whatever professors do neuroscience research and just contact them as soon as you get to college saying hey i'm interested um what can i do or do you have any or can i join your lab um, second thing, um, just because your school does not have neuroscience does not mean you can get it elsewhere. I'm self plug here for simply neuroscience. Um, my school did not have it. I joined my freshman year of college, um, simply neuroscience, and it's been such a great time to interact with peers here who love neuroscience and also to help others and to help my and to get the help also of just having to expand your neuroscience career. Whether it be internships, we have a 1000 plus opportunities page. So for any undergrad, for any future undergrads, um, that's a great resource for you. Or, the, or just simply Googling activities. And the, my final thing is that summer internships. Summer internships can be a valuable resource at different universities. And once you connect with those professors, keep in contact with them because they may have future projects for you. They may have future competitions for you to enter, um, other such things. So definitely those three things, um, finding professors, Google, inter Google opportunities, and summer internships.
Awesome. Thank you, folks. Uh, quick segue to the pre-med, pre-grad topic real quick. Uh, Everest was wondering about, could someone get their BA in psychology, then go an MD or a PhD in neuroscience? And in general, if any, any of you are, I'm pre-med, pre-grad, of course, you guys are pre-med, pre-grad, but if you are close to the application cycle, have any personal experiences or in general, have tips for either direction, if you'd be willing to share. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on the pre-grad track and you can absolutely, absolutely go into neuroscience research while majoring in something else. Like you can major in biology or biochemistry. The way that my program is set up um, within my university is that it's super inter interdisciplinary. So we're always taking tons of bio and chem and physics and computer science and sometimes cognitive or cellular or circuits-based courses. So you can really go within any of those paths or other ones too, and then major in them and then go to grad school and work in neuroscience research. Because um, a lot of times neuroscience research, I mean, almost always, it's always involving other fields at the same time, like an intersection of biology and chemistry, if you want to look at proteins in the brain or something like that. So you can definitely major in something else or get your BA or BSc in a different field and then want to go to grad school or med school and become like a neuroscientist or a neurologist. You, you can definitely do that. Yeah, I completely agree. Just want to add on really quickly that um, at Harvard, I think it's becoming more of a trend that more pre-meds or there are even more humanities students who are pre-med now. Um, so like in my comp lit program, I'm doing like a secondary and comp lit, but there's another comp lit student who is a pre-med and she's like doing her like major as comparative literature. And I think like when you're choosing like what you want to study in your undergrad, like it's not as, I guess, like important as you think it is when applying to these like post-grad programs. Um, they just want to see that you're like doing something that you're passionate about and that you're able to explore something you're actually genuinely excited about. Um, and I think like in my like her caption or like her comment in the chat was perfect too like they're becoming a lot more flexible with it um and like try not to box yourself in when deciding like what field you want to kind of study in your undergrad um yeah and I think it's also really valuable too to like have a mix of both the humanities and the stem when applying to these postgrad programs because you're kind of like developing this like holistic interdisciplinary education like Davina was mentioning a lot of schools are liberal arts so you're going to be taking other classes anyways like your foundational English requirements um so you're growing skills alongside like your your major if it's neuroscience for example so in the end you'll have a really holistic education regardless um and yeah, it's not like a super strict thing where you need to be studying something in undergrad to study it in like when you graduate. I guess, um, yeah, so I, um, yeah, there's not much to say after uh, what has been already said. Um, but yes, uh, you can major in anything. I met someone that majored in art that got into medical school. Um, I made. I also met another person that majored in international relations got into medical school. So you can major in anything you want. The reason why a lot of pre-meds uh, major in STEM fields is because um, a lot of those majors include the courses that are required for med school. So it's just easier to get them out of the way with your major than rather having to take them as electives when it could not match up with your time. Um, in but yeah, in terms of that, um, med school, um, I'm facing the brunt of it right now. Uh, so definitely take, take your time, make sure that you have great friends during this process. I know this is getting a little off topic, but Make sure you have a great support system. And because no matter what you major in, what matters the most is how you present yourself as an how you present yourself as an applicant. Great points all around. Uh, this question, I don't think we have gotten at a previous session. So I think we can brainstorm this together. Are there any neuroscience conferences aimed towards high school students? And we may need some crowd input as well. It's tough to think of ones off the top of your head.
I mean, outside of like simply neuroscience conferences that we have open to high school students, it, high school students, um, I was part of HOSA Future Health Professionals. I'm not sure if some of y'all have heard of it. It's like a pre-professional health club. It's not specifically neuroscience, but they have neuroscience related events. Um, so like they have conferences every single year, there's like a conference for like your area and then your state and then like the international level. Um, and so those are pretty frequent and they're huge. So like you get to meet so many other students who are pre-health, pre-med, um, but that's not specific to neuroscience. I'm not sure. I'm like kind of blanking on high school neuroscience conferences. Um, if anybody else can think of anything. I just did a quick search and it looks like Stanford has a virtual neuroscience forum, which didn't know it existed until two seconds ago. So very cool. Um, it also looks like the National Student Leadership Conference, which I believe might be a paid opportunity. They also seem to have a neuroscience focus. The more you know. Have any of you had the chance to attend conferences during undergrad? I know COVID and all's different story. I think it's been difficult, yeah, with COVID, but, um, oh no, we lost Amari. Hopefully she oh, no. back. <laughs> I did attend a Harvard Medical School conference for surgical oncology this past year um, to present like a science like poster. And that was really cool. I think that there's a lot of conferences that are through your school, even if it's like, you know, your school's medical school or like your school's graduate school, um, even just attending, even if you're not like presenting or anything, like if you have a professor who's presenting, you can be like, hey, like, can I come watch you present? Things like that. Um, and that's like a great networking opportunity. And just like, even if you're like intimidated to network, I know it can be like a big, um, it can be like really overwhelming to be in a big space like that. Just like being there and surrounded by people that, you aspire to be like is really inspiring. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend trying to get to those conferences. Also, a lot of schools offer funding to send you places. Like if you have are presenting a research paper that the conference is like maybe like in California and you're in Boston, for example, like what I wanted to do previously, then they might have some sort of grant available for you. So make sure to check that out because um, some schools do offer that. I think we just got Amari back. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what's going on with my laptop, but I am back now. But feel free to go. Whoever was next, you can speak. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say that I, I don't think I went to any neuroscience conferences in high school, to be honest. I don't know. There, there are definitely opportunities that are open to students in high school, for sure. But I just I don't think I heard about any of them. Um, in undergrad, a lot of students are doing research and a lot of professors are doing research and that's what the conferences are all about. So you're more aware of it. And I go to your uni a university that really focuses on research as well. So I guess we just hear about it more now, but there definitely are opportunities and conferences that you can go to in high school. I just unfortunately did not hear about them in time. Yeah, a lot of you are very ambitious. I'm very proud of you all for asking that. Um, yeah, I went to turtle school, no neuroscience at all. Um, undergrad, I haven't been to any, unfortunately, because of COVID for the past two years. Um, I just started doing neurosurgery research. So hopefully in about six months, if abstract gets accepted, crossing fingers, um, I'll be going to my first one. So definitely there's a lot more opportunities in undergrad than high school. Yeah, I'd also say I haven't really been to any conferences, but if you do get started on research really early and maybe let's say join a lab by cold calling or cold emailing, you might have that opportunity to end up going to a conference. So definitely start early if you're really ambitious. And I, I'm also proud because I don't even think I was thinking about that when I was in high school. So. Kudos to y'all for thinking very far ahead. Um, and also, manifesting in-person meetups at conferences. Maybe we'll, we're all gonna run into one another soon. That would be very fun. Uh, there's a quick question in the chat about online conferences. Recently heard that Cognitive Science Society is hybrid. And I think SIPS, Society for Improvement of Psychological Sciences online. Any other online conferences that we've heard of? I know SFN was hybrid.
I'm not sure. I think last year the neuroethics conference for the International Neuroethics Society was online. It was hybrid as well. Yeah. I think it's hybrid this year too, or April 24. Yeah. A lot more hybrid ones, which is a good sign, a good transition out of COVID. We also had a question a little bit earlier about, let me scroll back up here. Is it recommended to take neuroscience related courses offered by top universities, specifically their pre-college program or online courses and paying for them? I think that's a hard question to answer. So for my experience, I did pay for like an edX neuroscience class offered by Harvard. Um, like in my high school, like I think, or not in my high school, but during my high school years, I think it was like my sophomore year. And I remember thinking really hard about it. Like, is it really worth this fee? And like, can I get the same education from somewhere else? And maybe like reading on my own. Um, but what I think is nice about these like online courses that you can find is that they really give you like this structure. So if you're somebody who like, you know, self-studying is difficult, finding materials yourself is difficult, which is like very understandable. This might be the like, you know, the path for you. But again, remember, like, oftentimes they're like paywalls or like you need to, there's some sort of fee. Um, the edX class, I actually really did enjoy it. And then I found that the neuroscience class that they offer at Harvard that I took my freshman year was very similar to the edX class. So like, I think having had that exposure from that online class actually did help me. Um, so I think it really depends like what you're looking for, if you want that type of structure and you're willing to pay that price. Um, but there's also so many other ways to learn about neuroscience that don't require like money involved and that you can do on your own. So like if you want to just read research papers that you're interested in, or if you want to reach out to professors that are like doing research that you're interested in, you want to just talk to them on Zoom, for example. Um, there's so many other options, but I'm not like against these classes that are, you have to pay for, but just understand that they're kind of hit or miss. Um, so I would like maybe ask other students who've done them that class before or like who have used that website. Um, Cause I know edX and Coursera, for example, a ton of people have used those. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. I think there's definitely a huge, a huge difference um, because I think that between like summer courses and then online courses, online courses, yes, they are very expensive. But if you can finance it well, you can basically be do it. Sometimes pre-college courses, such as like, um, you know, at some like, oh, they'll teach you a class over the summer. Those can cost upwards of like $8,000, $10,000. So my recommendation, please do not do the summer ones. You can find internships that will pay you instead of you paying them. So definitely do that. Um, but yeah, online courses, as Sasha mentioned, edX courses are really great to do. Um, while, 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 while they can be expensive on some sites, they all do offer uh, great skills, great education, and um, can give you really great things. There's also a lot of free resources online. Um, toss up idea, uh, because we've been mentioning BrainD, if you don't have a brain V competition near you, start one yourself. Go to your high school, start a brain V team, work with a teacher and compete. That's a great thing to start there. We've got a question about gap years, folks. Let's talk about gap years real quick. Do they decrease your chance for getting scholarships? How do you feel about gap years for admission? What do you think? Anyone done a gap year before college by chance? I don't know. In between though, between college and grad school? No one is taking a gap year right now. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I took this past year off from school at Stanford, which is technically a gap year. So I guess I can kind of talk about this. I took the gap year specifically for my mental health. That was the reason why I felt that it was necessary in order for me to get better and like be in a more stable place, a happier place that I needed to take a break from academics and really focus on my personal life. So yes, um, gap years can be a wonderful thing. I feel like 
med schools, most people that are on average applying now have taken at least one or two gap years. So it's not to discourage or encourage anybody, but if you do feel like it's necessary, then by all means, go ahead. I plan on taking a gap year once I graduate, probably going to be working as a medical assistant for a year to gain that clinical experience. Um, you can also do post-batch research if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, if you plan on, you know, even just working a regular job in order to save up money to go to medical school. So they do like real world experiences and real world experiences that are authentic to you. So don't just go straight into medical school because that's the timeline and that's what you should do. There's no like should do anything. You're living on your own timeline. Don't get burnt out. Make sure you're okay before you go into medical school. And yeah, gap years. I loved my gap year that I took this year. And yeah, if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask. PLDR, gap years aren't bad folks. Uh, I know a lot of pre-med kind of lore has been that taking a gap year is bad, but I think it's actually turning so that a growing majority of folks are taking gap years now and the non-traditional has become going straight through, which is a very interesting dynamic switch. So don't, don't feel bad about taking a gap year. And I know I've been purposefully skirting some of the research questions because you guys briefly talked about it a little bit earlier and I also wanted to link to this workshop recording from Nikita, who you saw this morning. So take a, take a deep dive through that one. It has a lot of great tips that are relevant for high school internships and college as well. We have one minute to go, folks. Any last sage words of advice you want to share with our audience today? Um, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, you know, definitely advice here. Um, if you're interested in neuroscience, Google opportunities. Google is such a great resource. Dig, 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 and you will find opportunities. Uh, second thing, please do not panic. I know a lot of high school kids, undergrads, even myself, but right now, um, we try to panic and compare ourselves to other people and we have imposter syndrome ourselves sometimes it's you know everybody's on their own individual path and you need to be satisfied of what you can do what your ability is don't compare yourself to everyone everyone also has their own struggles you just can't see them so just keep doing what you're doing and you know what life works out life does work out so you know just keep on pushing I always love you because like concluding remarks, they're always good. They're always the best. Um, completely echo everything you have said. Like you just being here on this call just shows that you're already taking the initiative. You're already thinking about these big questions. Um, and the types of questions that y'all have been asking are like, you know, we haven't, we didn't even think about these things at your age. So um, it's really impressive. And like you said, um, try not to panic. You'll be okay. You'll end up where you will end up. And um, you know, college seems like this big daunting thing and applications can feel overwhelming, but just know that you have mentors out there. Like you can always use SN as a resource as well. Like emailing us, well, I'm, I'll provide my email in the chat as well. If you have any questions specifically about um, Harvard that I can help answer. Um, but yeah, just reach out when you, when you need help and don't be afraid to like ask for help and ask questions and people in your life can help you. Um, yeah, I'll pass it on to somebody else. Yeah, honestly, echoing everything that everyone else has been saying, all the questions that you guys have been asking are excellent about gap years, how to apply to universities, what will they look for, what things will fill your applications, you guys are all in the right place, asking all the right questions, and we're here for you, so please feel free to always email us, you can always email me if you have any questions about brain D, if you need any help studying, or if you need any study tips, I'm always happy to chat with people about it, or if you are concerned about cold emailing, you can always reach out to me and I can share my cold email template if you want. And I'm sure that SN resources have, um, they have information about this stuff as well. So we're just here to make something that can seem a little daunting and challenging, hopefully easier and let you know that we're here for you wherever you are along your, your neuroscience journey.
Yeah, and I'll just say that um, make the most out of whatever you have. If you don't have like opportunities when it comes to research or you don't have, let's say a hospital nearby you or things like that, start your own podcast, start your own blog, do things like that where you can show that you have initiative and you really are interested in neuroscience so that colleges will look at you and you'll stand out amongst your peers. You're already standing out by attending something like this and getting a certificate from it. So just keep on doing stuff like that. Attend, I know Stanford has um, a program called Leadership Education for Aspiring Physicians. They also do what's called a SUMA conference. So just keep attending conferences, keep putting yourself out there. Um, LinkedIn, that's also really important. Start connecting with people, like get, get yourself out there. And if you have any questions on Stanford top schools, four-year plans, neuroscience, anything, feel free to reach out to me. And I'm sure just like, the other panelists reach out to them too, because we're all here to help. On that note, everyone, if you could join me in a really warm round of applause for our wonderful panelists. Thank you all for taking your time, especially because it's like 10 p.m. right now for you guys. <laughs> oh, it's late. Um, and also for a lot of folks who are here very early in the morning, thank you all for attending as well and for all of your thoughtful questions. It's always great for us to see and hear from so many of you tuning in. Um, it makes all the logistics and organizing seem wonderful at the end of the day. A source of dopamine, I love that socket. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining. We will see you guys tomorrow or perhaps later in the day, depending on where you are for our next workshop in the series that's about pursuing international opportunities. So continuing a lot of threads from this conversation and we'll see you then. Thank you all, take care. Bye everyone, thank you for attending. Bye everyone.